I want to draw a parallel to that with, with the early days of Priceline. And you know, we see a lot of pitches and uh, some of the ideas, they, they seem kind of crazy, a little far-fetched and away from the norms and we call it disruptive as well. Um, and I assume in the early days of Priceline with the new models, some of the investors might have thought, it's not going to work, or it's, you know, it's, it's a little out there. Um, how do we evaluate, I mean, I, I would like to get your thoughts on this. How do we evaluate an idea which is a little away from the norms and you know, not miss out on the okay. next Priceline? So here, I, 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 I'll just tell you one other story that I just shared at, at Startup Grind as well, because it's how I learned this lesson. Um, I, I tend to learn by anecdotes. You can tell me anything, but show me. Show me some company that did this and how they did it, and then I'll believe you. So since I learned that way, I talk that way too. Um, but uh, you know, I, what I learned to do was stop trusting my own judgment on these disruptive things. So first, if it doesn't have a big market, I'm not sure why we care anyway, right? I don't think many people are saying, we're hoping to find a product with, invest in a product with a small market that has very few buyers, right? We're looking for big markets. So uh, let's start with that core assumption. This thing, this disruptive thing, purportedly has a big market. If it has a big market, then the next question you ask is, am I that market? And if I'm not, why on earth am I listening to my instinct or myself on that? So I'll tell you how I learned that. I was talking to a guy who was in the retail business, a, 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 this elder gentleman, who uh, built retail that was a retail concept, stores, that was against everything the expert said. Everybody in the investment world from VCs to whatever, and the experts in retail said, you can't do it that way, it's, it's a guaranteed failure. But he did it anyway. So I said to him, how did you know that would work? Same question you asked, how do you vet this out? And he said, oh, it's easy. A farmer in a John Deere hat told me. And I said, wait, what? I said, I have to hear this story. So he said, Jeff, he described his office. He said, we have MBAs that work for us. They're smart, educated, upscale, preppy. He described, he said, I need these people. And he said, but the problem is they're not the customer and I'm not the customer. And I said, who's the customer? And he said, my customer is that low end, you know, well, here's what he said specifically. He said, my customer is in the diner on the other side of railroad tracks wearing this John Deere hat, you know, and their overalls and eating apple pie. And he said, my employees have never met these people on this side of town. They don't eat in the diner. They eat in the upscale restaurants. They don't shop at the same place. They don't know each other. And he said, so me and my employees live on this side of town and our customers are on these little diners eat in, in their overalls eating apple pie. And I said, so what did you do? And he said, I started to schedule time every other Friday. I would change clothes. I would go to one of these diners and I would just sit and buy people apple pie and just sit there and chat with people all day. He said, those farmers told me how to build this thing. Well, the cool part of the story is the guy I spent the day with was Sam Walton and his little idea was Walmart. And Walmart, when it was built, was said, you can't build a big box store in small town America. You can't do any of these things. So he didn't listen to all the experts. He said, I just hung out in the diner with people eating apple pie. And they said, well, what we really need are diapers at this price, but not the high end brand. I mean, they told him exactly what they would buy, how much they would buy. He talked to these people. So what I've learned to do is not trust my own instinct if I'm not the customer. I tell my employees, you know, we now make these cardboard cutouts of our customer. And I have them in my office. My employees will walk in and they'll say, got an idea. And I'll say, tell Jane. And I'll point to the cutout and they go, she's not going to understand this. And I say, then I'm not interested. Okay? <laughs> if the farmer can't, you can't explain it to the farmer, then don't, I don't care if that's who the product's for. And now they come in my office. They'll have an idea. They'll look at the paper, they'll look at me, they'll look at the cutout, and they just leave without saying anything, right? Until you know who you serve. So I just want to tell you, Will, quick funny story that closes. That's, that's what I do now, right? When I hear a good idea. I, I, I did a TV interview with some CEOs recently, and she said, what do you guys and CEOs and investors do when you hear a good idea? And everybody's answer was, I get my smartest people when you go in the conference room. And I said, I get my car keys and I go in the parking lot. And everyone's like, what? And I say, I go to wherever those people are that I think are going to buy this and hang out and find out if they're really going to buy it. I don't know the answer to that. So just a really quick, funny story that validated this for me. When we were first launching all the Priceline companies, um, this Wall Street Journal reporter that always kind of followed my career calls me and goes, what are you working on? And I said, we got this new idea. And he said, how does it work? And I told him, and he said, quote, that's stupid. No one's going to do that. And I said, no one's going to do what he's, no one's going to do the, you don't know what airline you're flying, you get no miles, you don't know when you're leaving and you pay in advance or whatever. And I remember saying to him, I was pretending <laughs> to rustle some papers and he said, what are you looking at? I said, marketing budget, not really. And he said, I said, oh, here it is. 
And I said, the total amount of money we have allocated to market to you and everybody you know is um, zero, right? And I said, our customers not only don't work for the Wall Street Journal, they don't even read it, okay? And I said, so your opinion really is about as relevant as mine. I wouldn't actually use this airline product even though we're building it. So the interesting punchline was at about one year after the IPO, I mean, remember these were insane and stupid times. But we had a website and a small number of employees, relatively speaking, and the market cap was $22 billion. This website, and I get this call, and my assistant's like, hey, it's someone from the Wall Street Journal. And I take the call, and he's like, I just called to congr congratulate the team at Priceline. And I said, congratulate us on what? And he said, I just did the math, and you guys could buy every single airline in the entire United States right now. <laughs> and I said, that's impressive for a dumb idea. And he said, what dumb idea? And I said, never mind. <laughs> if I had listened to my own employees, myself, our team, or guys like that, we never would have built it. So we're the smart people in this room. We've all made money and been successful because we're smart. Totally irrelevant. Okay, if the product is for a farmer, no one cares what you think. And if you even care what you think, you might have missed the next Walmart or the next Priceline or whatever it is yeah. because you listen to the wrong people. That's the lesson I learned is we don't vet out our own stuff if we're not the <laughs> customer.